Welcome to Insight. Today we're chatting with Michael Scalamiero, Executive Director of the Miami City Ballet. Michael has generously agreed to share some of his experience with us. I'd like to thank you, Michael, for joining us today. Thank you for having me. I'm glad to be here. So the ballet scene in Miami is very exciting, led by you, led by your company. Talk about ballet in Miami. Ballet in Miami is basically Miami City Ballet. We are the, we're the big player in the room. Um, the company just completed uh, its 30th season and it's one of the largest in, in the United States and it is a, one of a very few number of uh, Balanchine focused ballet companies in the United States, meaning it, it is known for its interpretation of the works of George Balanchine. Uh, the artistic director, Lourdes Lopez, is a uh, danced for Mr. Balanchine. She danced for Jerome Robbins. She was a star at New York City Ballet, and uh, she is in her fifth season, and she has brought her aesthetic and her love of the Balanchine Robbins repertoire to this company while also expanding the repertoire um, to, I think, be more representational of what Miami is and to attract a younger audience and to um, continue to keep ballet as relevant as possible, which is a challenge for the classical arts. And, and one of the challenges is honoring the past. Ballet must be anchored in past practice, mm -hmm. yet it cannot be so anchored in past practice that it doesn't progress into new forms and new ideas and new ways of interpretation. How is that balance struck? Well, and you're, you're absolutely right. I think the balance is struck by um, knowing what your strengths are in terms of um, the aesthetic of the company and the repertoire, and then also introducing audiences and the dancers to new works, to challenge them, to create um, ballets that reach new audiences. Um, and so we have a commitment not only to the Balanchine repertoire, but to commissioning new work. Um, in fact, in February, uh, we are presenting our second commission by Alexei Rotmansky, who is uh, one of the foremost choreographers working today. Um, his reimagining of uh, The Fairy's Kiss, mm. the Hans Christian Andersen tale. It's a dark tale, um, and it's brand new from the bottom up, sets, costumes, choreography. Uh, and so we have a commitment to bringing new work to our audiences. So I think you, you do that by um, commissioning new work and also bringing into the rep um, ballets that have been created but have not been seen by Miami audiences. And there's quite a bit of that on each of our seasons as well. How do you keep it from being static? How do you keep from repeating after you were 17 years in, in uh, I believe it was Pennsylvania, at the, at the, uh, the Pennsylvania Ballet? Mm -hmm. That's a huge tenure. How do you keep yourself fresh and keep yourself from repeating or trying to bring to Miami City just practices that might not work as well in Miami as they did in, in uh, Philadelphia. It's really not that difficult. When, when I look back at my career in Philadelphia, which I am so grateful for and I really enjoyed, um, there are some things that worked and there are some things that didn't work. Um, and so you simply have to bring with you, you, first of all, you have to have the self-awareness to know what worked and what didn't work. And um, Well, also, people probably will tell you. Right? This is true. <laughs> this is true. And, the companies were very similar, but they're also very different. And so when I came to Miami, it was there was a clean slate in that I didn't know the artists, I didn't know Lourdes, I didn't know the board, and I didn't know the community. So that gives you an opportunity to really dig in and get to know what their strengths are and, and, and develop new working relationships. And then there's some, certainly there's some continuity in terms of how you deal with your board and how you lead the staff and the relationship you forge with the artistic director. Um, I'm fortunate that I, I have a strong, um, productive relationship with Lourdes. We are truly partners in the sense that we we are always looking to support one another. And it's it's never the artistic has to come first and you just need to figure out a way to make it work. Um, what I've learned here with in working with the company is the dancers themselves are just so generous of time and spirit and they really don't view themselves off to the side as a separate part of the organization. They are the organization and they interact well with and want to interact not only with audiences but with the staff, with the administrative staff. And I'm talking about, you know, in, in the PR department and the finance office and the development office and the outreach department. They're, they're, um, 
they really want to be part of the organization beyond what they do on the stage. Is it also a matter of opening yourself up and creating a culture of interaction and and uh, polite challenge, where you're where you open yourself up to somebody else having a different perspective and listening to that perspective and being affected by it? Because if you if you can open yourself up in that way, then then you it really is a preventative from becoming too um, confirmed in your old habits, right? Because you because people are constantly they have their habits, they have their ways of thinking. Exactly. And then if you listen, if you give them respect, and you really think, well, okay, let's let's try that. And, and you have to do that, and particularly with the dancers, because the dancers' career is very short, and their lives in the studio they they are managed every minute of their day. Right. They're given very little opportunity to have meaningful input other than what they express through their their craft. So. Um, for them to be able to weigh in in terms of a social media campaign or to sit down with management and talk about the work conditions or um, have some ideas in terms of branding and, and photography and video and, and all of that, they love that because it gives them an opportunity to have a voice which they typically just don't have in the studios. Talk about your attendance and talk about the footprint of the ballet because you have quite a, a broad footprint in, in this part of the country. So we, um, we do, we have uh, an annual, we serve over 100,000 uh, individuals and children annually. Um, we, our home is in Miami Beach, our Miami uh, home for performances is the Arch Center in downtown, but we, ac we actually have three cities. We're, in, right. we're at the Broward Center in Fort Lauderdale, we go to West Palm Beach at the Kravis Center, and then we're also in Naples uh, several times a year as well. In fact, the company opens Nutcracker this season in, in Naples um, this weekend. Um, the, the demographic of each county and each venue is a little bit different. Miami by far is our youngest demographic. Um, I would say Naples is the oldest, and Broward is kind of in between. Um, what we've found since Lourdes has taken over uh, is that there is I, I think this is truly because of the, the, the repertoire, um, that the, the audiences are becoming more diverse and skewing younger, um, which is definitely what we, we, we were hoping would happen. Um, we also have probably the most diverse company uh, of the major professional companies in the country. We have dancers from Brazil and Cuba and Colombia and France and Austria and the United States and um, Switzerland. and the Sort of looks like Miami. I, I, exactly. Um, we have more Latins and Hispanics than any other country, uh, any other company in the country. And our school, which is a feeder for the company, is even more diverse. Um, we have a special relationship with a school in Brazil. Um, we have 60 boys that come to Miami City Ballet every summer for Brazilian summer intensive. Um, so we consider ourselves the gateway to the Americas. So let's let let's segue from from the uh, audience attendance and and the footprint uh, for your performances to the school. Mm -hmm. uh, talk about the school. How many students do you have uh, annually? And and talk about the intent behind the school. The school um, is organized into divisions um, from pre ballet all the way up to uh, pre professional one and two. So there are different levels based on age and ability. Um, it is a, uh, a by audition only school. Um, there is tuition that individuals pay. The commitment um, can be starting as little as an hour and a half a week up to the pre-professional, which is um, between 20 and 25 hours a week that these young adults are, are at our studios while also pursuing a high school degree. Right. The, the, perp, the, the mission of the school is obviously to offer dance training at a very high level with the ultimate goal of being able to um, have these students um, obtain jobs at Miami City Ballet or any of the other major companies throughout the country. Um, there's also a community track though where um, students are not necessarily looking for training to become professional dancers, but they want to engage in dance in some capacity. Um, we have, um, our, our academic year is roughly from September through May, and that has about 400, 500 students, and then our summer intensives um, of which there are three, we ha uh, is about another three to four hundred students, and then we have an open uh, community open division, which is adults, and that's another six hundred 
students. So all told, um, the number is somewhere around 1,500 enrolled in some capacity at the Miami City Ballet School. So now we all have to go and visit Miami City Ballet. Michael Escalamiero, thank you so much for sharing your work and the work of your company in ballet. And thank you so much for your insights. You're quite welcome. Thank you for having me.